response. What's happening this morning? Right. How's it look this morning? Uh, it doesn't look uh, as bad as it did yesterday when the waves were breaking uh, at the bottom of my property. Uh, it's uh, high tide as we speak, and it's nice and gently rolling in. We've got a uh, west-southwest wind coming in, so it's off the land, and it looks as calm as can be at the moment. Now, I know you bought the property about five years ago. Um, I'm sure lots of people will be thinking, when you did the survey, kind of what were you told in terms of the risk to the property? Uh, the risk to the property at the time was the coastal erosion around here was reckoned at about a metre a year. That would have given me 30, 40, even 50 years, uh, which would have seen my lifetime out. So I didn't have any worries. Then we were hit by the beast from the east and the following storm, and it wiped all that out in, in that fortnight. And Lance, just a, we'll, we'll uh, speak to Angela in just a moment, but just a final one. I mean, you've got a race against time. You're going to try and actually move your house, aren't you? How long are the experts telling you you've got? Well, they want me to rush through and get it done as soon as possible. Um, I was speaking to the council yesterday and they've currently allowed me a week to 10 days. So, you know, the sooner I can get the equipment up here to get it done, the better. Absolutely. Well, we wish you well with it. Um, Angela, you, you've looked into this in great detail and where Lance lives, they're not the only ones around the UK coastline at risk of this, are they? That's it. And, and you know, for Lance and everyone, it's just such an appalling situation because they face losing everything. There is no insurance, there is no compensation. And what we're seeing is that people have bought these houses or they've inherited the houses along the coast. It's the dream lifestyle to live by the seaside. And then climate change is accelerating these extreme weather events. And so with comfort, they were given by either estate agents or surveyors is proving not to be true. And their gardens are disappearing. And before they know it, they get an eviction and a demolition order from, from their local authorities. And, and then they have to go into council accommodation and they've lost their dream home. So it's an awful situation that we're not prepared for it at all in the UK. We've got one of the largest coastlines in Europe. We've got the fastest eroding cliffs. And what One Home My Organisation did is we looked at the 21 most at-risk communities in England, and it's all around the coast. It's not just in Norfolk and East Riding in Yorkshire, which are quite well known, but it's in Essex, it's in Kent, it's in Dorset, Cornwall, the Isle of Wight, Cumbria. It's a problem we are going to see more and more as the world warms and extreme weather events become more dominant then these cliffs are crumbling and then collapsing much faster than anyone's anticipated. Lance, um, coastal defence work, that's what's being called for. What evidence have you seen of that happening where you are? Um, everything's gone through the planning permission stages with the Greater Yard and Borough Council. We've been fantastic. We're just waiting on the uh, marine management organisation to sign off theirs. And that's been over a year now when we don't understand what the hold up is. We know that they, uh, there's planning permission for a rock berm to be put on the beach that's about a kilometre to a kilometre and a half long, uh, consisting of rocks being brought in from Cornwall, which is fantastic, but we needed it yesterday. So, you know, now the uh, council can uh, use the emergency powers and start getting things started off down here on the beach and shoring up the road for the residents that do live down here. Angela, is that kind of a typical tale, you know, in terms of the time management of these coastal defence works? Yeah, so the cost of 15 million, basically they've worked out it'll cost at least 15 billion pounds to put in all the sea defences we need, but it might double that if climate change happens at worst case scenario, which currently it is tracking. So it's the financial, but it's also the policy. So basically a third of our coastline has already been designated as no active intervention. And what that means is regardless of what homes or heritage sites or wildlife or infrastructure we will lose, there is not a financial or environmental case to save those communities. And so that's why we're going to see a lot more villages and hamlets lost as time goes on. The, the designations are in something called shoreline management plans. They've been public information for nearly 20 years and most people have never heard of them. So it means that everyone's been given a status of either hold the line, which means put up those sea defences, or no active intervention, which means no more sea defences will be built. And one of the reasons we did this project was people just didn't know. So I was going to areas that I knew were going to be 
it, you know, you're not supposed to use the word abandoned, but to the people that live there, that's what it feels like. And they were putting extensions on their homes because the message isn't being communicated that these decisions have already been made. And for where there is a desire to save those people, they still need the money and their sea defences are really expensive. And so they have to get millions of pounds. For, and, and where are they supposed to find that money? We local authorities through austerity really don't have much money at all in their budgets. So where is this money supposed to come from? Uh, Angela Terry, environmental scientist, thank you. And Lance Martin, um, wishing you all the best with the house. Um, thanks very much for talking to us. Thank you for the opportunity. It's uh, 21 minutes past nine now. Uh, we've been talking about the Oscars a bit this morning. Never mind the Oscars. Oh, no, the glittering prize ceremony that really should capture the attention this morning is the British Pie Awards. Why wouldn't it? Absolutely. Why wouldn't it? The big winner was called the Moon Blue Steak Ale and Stilton Cheese. We're going to talk to its creator shortly. Yeah, but first, Elise Chamberlain has been to Melton Mowbray to mingle with the upper crust of the pie world. It's a grand setting for this gastronomic gathering where one food rules, pies. Each entry lovingly handcrafted, a reflection of the creativity and skill of its maker. Time now to meet some of them. I'm Claire from Brockleby Pies. I'm Alex from Baldi's Pies in Wigan. I'm Mark. I'm from the Treacle Town Pie Company in Macclesfield. I'm Jay from Pytalic. The rules are clear. Each pie's filling has to be wholly encrusted in pastry. But what lies beneath the surface? Buffalo buffalo. It's a bison in spicy bean sauce, which is a play on great fast food without the additives. They make people happy. And whatever the situation is economically or whatever's going on in your life, there's a, there's a pie for all situations. We've got the big gym and we've got nearly as good as Mama John's lasagna. I've got one which is homage to my father, who passed away in 2020. And then the other one, is, this is for my mum because obviously she lived in Italy. When I made this about six months ago, I sold out of them and couldn't give her one to eat. <laughs> so I'm going to have to, I've got a few spur that I'm going to uh, take around tomorrow. I'm sure she'll like it and if she doesn't, she'll definitely tell me. It's basically a deconstructed version of a bacon cheeseburger wrapped in pastry. We've done all sorts over the years. We've done a fried chicken pie, so fried chicken and gravy in a pie. If it tastes good, we'll put it in a pie. One of the pies we're entering is the Italian style meatball. I first entered this in 2015 and at the time, my son was seven and uh, he said, Dad, let's make an unusual pie. He loves spaghetti and meatballs, so I said, Right, let's make a, a meatball pie. It got bronze. I've not entered it since, so I thought, you know, I'll give it a go this year. Do you still like eating a pie? Do you ever get sick of it? I'm them? not a pie fan. No. I'm not a pie person, I'm really not. I prefer sausage rolls, actually. When there's this much variety, it's tough to know how to stand out and what really makes a pie of pies. The appearance. Does it look good? Number two, the pastry. Is it soggy on the bottom, boil over? Every pie has a hole in the top where the steam comes out. But if you get excess mixture coming out the top, that's not good. Is the filling, is there enough of it? Does it reach the top? You don't want any gaps between the filling and the pastry. And then the taste. Coveted prizes await as well as constructive feedback from the judges to help keep a plethora of pie makers coming back each year, eager for a piece of the action. That was Elise Chamberlain uh, reporting uh, here in the studios in Jalland of uh, Brockleby Pies, who won the top prize. Down the line from Melton Mowbray, Stephen Hallam. He was one of the organisers of this year's competition. Stephen, morning to you in the kitchen now. We'll talk to you in just a moment, but... Um, Ian, to you first of all, often simple ideas are the best, aren't they? Who, who had the idea of putting Stilton in with your existing steak and ale pie? Um, well, we were doing a steak and ale pie, which was really, really popular, but we just thought we'd like to enrich it. And we're from Melton Mowbray and um, Leicestershire, it's home of Stilton cheese. So it was, it was a no-brainer, really. We just put a bit of Stilton crumb in and um, enrich the sauce. And how many pies do Brockleby pies, Brockleby's pies make? Um, it's, we've got a lot of seasonality, but um, between 4,000 and 10,000 a week. So we're out of season at the moment, so we're doing about 4,000. What is the definition of a pie? Definition of a pie, it has to be totally, so it has to be a, a filling which is totally encased in pastry. Yeah. So it can't be when you, when you go to a pub, a gastro pub, and you just have like a pot with a lid on it, that's not a pie. 
Oh, it is a pie. Oh, I agree. No, I agree. It, no, it that is a pie. pie. That has got to be a pie. What, and what, okay, what about fish pie? Why is fish pie, when it's topped with potato, called fish pie? No idea, but, <laughs> but we do a fish pie. We do a penguin pie. Which is, yeah, which it's is, not really penguin. No, it's not really penguin. It's smoked haddock, cheese, onion, and potato. Oh, wow. And that's fully encased. No, so there's no potato topping, potatoes in it. So, Stephen, what makes, for the, from the judge's point of view, when you're judging a pie, what makes a perfect pie? Uh, four criteria, really, and they all uh, are based around your senses. So it has to look good. Would you, if you saw it, buy it? And uh, if it doesn't look good, you're not going to buy it. And then, having bought it, does it live up to your expectations? So, um, in, in terms of appearance, it shouldn't be too dark, too pale. It should be baked properly. It shouldn't be overglazed. It should be glazed just appropriately. Uh, then the baking, the, the baking needs to be perfect. I've touched on it there. Uh, if it's overbaked, uh, touching on being burnt, shouldn't even be in the competition, and vice versa. It's been underbaked. Um, and then when you cut into the pie, you're looking at the pastry, the thickness of the pastry, nice and even all over. When we talk about baked penetration, the, the pastry should be thoroughly baked and uh, not, not under or overbaked. And you, you get a real clear view of that having cut the pie. And the pastry should taste good as well. It's 50% of the pie. Uh, not, it's not all just about the filling. And there's a harmony between the pastry and the filling as well. And then, you know, it, it, uh, in terms of texture and, and fluidity and all the rest, then you come to the filling itself. Um, if it's got pieces of meat in it or, or whatever, uh, if it should be particulate, it shouldn't be mushed. Um, you're looking at the name of the pie. Whatever the pie is being called should be reflected in all these four criteria. So if, for example, it is a lamb and rosemary pie, then you would expect, as a judge, to be seeing and tasting lamb and, and uh, rosemary should be coming through on the palate for the flavour. That's in brief. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a huge brief, but it's very clear. Um, when you were um, looking after the judges, how many pies did they have to taste and how did they... I mean, how do you keep tasting pies where they're all just not merging into one? Yeah, well, there's hot and cold pies. So if a pie's being developed, and this is, this is relevant to the judges, so if a pie's been developed to be eaten hot, then uh, it should be judged hot. So that's what we do. We warm them up uh, and vice versa for the cold pies. They, they come out of the fridge, but we leave them for uh, an hour or two before they're judged. Dis the, the chill dissipates, and therefore you get a much rounder spectrum of flavours on your palate. In terms of judges... Uh, judges are paired up into, so the judge in two, and there's 16 pies per judge. So we have 23 classes of judges, uh, sorry, 23 classes of pies, and determining, uh, depending on the number of pies per class, will determine how many judges there are in that class. I'm going to volunteer how, for next Well, I, this was going to be my question. How many people apply to be a judge at the Pie, pie Judge Pie Awards? <laughs> Yes, well, yes. Uh, send, send me an email or something. Get in touch. <laughs> there, 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 there's people that there's people that are close and know, and there's people that don't, and there's people uh, from the media. And it's a question of pairing people up so that there's a good rapport and conversation goes on yeah. outside the judging process. It you fabulous. Asked, yeah. yeah, you you quickly you are you asked about how do you keep your palate clean? Well, we we use lime squash, mm -hmm. uh, not lemons. People might think. Uh, and, and lime cordial, uh, that cuts through seasoning, and especially pepper, so your palate isn't blown. So, Ian, how, how long does it take to come up with a concept for a pie? Is it as quick as that, or do you have a lot of testing? And this one is like chilli con carne in a pie. Yeah, that's a ruffalo buffalo pie. Um, how long it... We have a look at our range and see if there's something missing, and then we see what other people are doing, see if there's a trend, and then we just, we just sit down and you know, work out ideas. Uh, some, and then we come up with a creative name to mark to market the pie. So and that, that's how it works. That simple, really. The name's key, isn't it? Moon Blue is yeah, really is. clever. I've got lots of interesting names: Moon Blue, Ruffalo Buffalo, Penguin, um, Alibaba, which is uh, like a tagine using mutton. So you know, it's, it's it's part part of our sort of our plan. And what what's what's in the pipeline for next year? Are you allowed to say? <laughs> My director um, just said the pie line. So what we do, uh, I, I, we, I didn't decide what pies we put in. I, I went to the production team. Every Thursday we have a tasting panel, so we get the whole production team in, and there's half of them does another, so we eat the pies. 
and then we decide what's good, what needs improving. And I said to, said to the girls, look, pie awards, you know, put in whatever you think's great. And so yeah. they did, and it wouldn't. So it's going to be down to them, not to me. Congratulations to you and the team. Thank Congratulations. You. And uh, um, Stephen, thank you very much as well for all that really interesting pie and information as well. <laughs> no loads of lime squash, that's the trick. Um, perfect to go over to Saturday Kitchen because they take over from us at 10 o'clock now. Got any pie on the show? We, we, we did pies last week, actually. Uh, sorry you missed it. I was making a pie. It was a delicious pie. Uh, pastilla. Actually, it was not really a pie. It's a pastilla. Um, but no, sadly, we haven't. Trust you uh, to have posh pie. Yeah, I know. That's me all over, right? <laughs> man of, man of the people. <laughs> that was really interesting, though. I like that. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad you approve. Am I going to approve of your programme today? Of course you are. You always, always do, no? Always. <laughs> right, our special guest today is the wonderful Sarah Cox. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. How are you? Very good. Excited. You're partial to a pie, aren't you? Love pie. Love a, a, a plate meat pie like my granddad plate used to make. Pie. Yeah, just like meat, mince, pastry, bosh. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Recipe to follow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm so elaborate. Um, now, listen, you've done this show quite a few times. Yes. Before. End of show, Food Heaven, Food Hell. Uh, tell us about your Food Heaven. Pastime. Food Heaven, uh, I've had a long and complicated relationship with Korean food. <laughs> and, and I love it. Well, I grew to love it. I was over there working when I was really young and I didn't understand it. No, I do. I love it. I want to eat it as much as possible. So okay. please give me some. Hell would be uh, gnocchi. <laughs> and I know they say gnocchi. don't, don't gnocchi it until you tried it. Um, <laughs> No, literally no one says that. <laughs> but I would, if you can make me like gnocchi, it'd be yeah. a miracle. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Great. We're going to be talking about your uh, your new novel as well, just a yes. bit, and your book show out on yes. Monday between the covers. Between the cover starts Monday, seven o'clock, BBC Two. Exactly. <laughs> Look at that straight in everything. Uh, before that, though, let's find out what's on the menu today. Georgina Hayden, you've got a one pot wonder for us. Hello. Right? Yeah, I have. So I'm doing a sweet cinnamon chicken tomato orzo tray bake. Mm -hmm. Finish with lots of halloumi. Greek Cypriot vibes, mm -hmm. really nice. Nice, yeah. very nice. Julie Lynn, first time on the show, welcome along. First time, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. <laughs> uh, delicious Malaysian food. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to make you sambal lala, which translates as sambal clams. So it's thick kind of chilli paste, cooked in clams, and it's a Malacca classic. You're going to love it. Very nice. Mm. What about you, girl? What you got? I've got wine. Helen McGinn, everyone, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> Needs no introduction. So, yeah, these were really <laughs> lovely dishes to match this week. So, I've got yeah. a couple of hidden gems we're right. going to share in the show later. Do you yeah. like a pie? I love a pie. What's your favourite? Uh, but I think I'll probably go down the simple pie route. Yeah, thanks for your support. Yeah, because he was taking the mickey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice, simple but pie. Some pies yeah. you don't need messing with. Yeah. Okay. Just go. Always, always paste your bottom. Yes. Yeah? Yes. No question. Could be like that. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you not have pastry on the bottom? That makes sense. Some, you know, some people have made pies without pastry on the bottom. <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, we see you at 10. Matt, I don't think pastry should be on the bottom. There's too oh. much of it. Do you think? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You've got to like controversial. Like the pastry. It's no. all about the pastry. And I, and I think a pie can be topped with potato as well. But there's a whole other conversation. Your well, show said... What? Why? You carry on arguing amongst yourselves. I yeah. think some people want to see news, but hey, let's talk about pies. Uh, we'll do I the news too. It's more fun than some of the news, to be honest. But hey. I'll argue with you about your program next week. Have a good okay, one good. today. I'll see see you. All right, stay with us. The headlines are on the way.